So next up, we're on our final session of the 2021 um, conference. Sorry, I've lost my words. It's got to that part of conference where I can not speak anymore. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome uh, Eleanor Harding, who's the National Trust's Assistant Curator in Wales and is currently curator working on a project at Penryn Castle to confront and present the castle's relationships to histories of slavery and exploitation, which she's going to discuss with us today. So I'm going to hand over to Eleanor now. Thanks, Emma. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Fab. Cool. Um, all right, well, hiya, pal. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Eleanor Harding. I'm an assistant curator for the Trust in Wales. And um, yeah, as Emma said, I'm going to be talking today about how we've begun to address histories of colonialism and slavery um, with a group of staff and volunteers who I guess just didn't sign up for that when they joined the Penryn team. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a bit of background on Penryn and then um, focus on the following, uh, how we've triggered the conversation about slavery and colonialism at Penryn, uh, what we've done to skill staff and volunteers up to engage with these histories, and uh, our work to get the full team on board so that person-to-person -person interactions don't undermine the trust commitment to inclusivity and representation um, or the kind of mental, emotional and physical safety of vulnerable staff and volunteers and visitors. Um, so Penryn Castle uh, is in fact a um, enormous, elaborately disguised house um, on a hill on the outskirts of Bangor in North Wales. Uh, it was built during the 1830s for George Hay Dawkins Pennant in a neo-Norman style, which didn't really take off. Um, and the money to build it and also to acquire the wider estate of 72,000 acres, which is a significant chunk of what is now Snowdonia National Park, was generated by the work of enslaved people on sugar plantations in Jamaica. In 1835, after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, Dawkins Pennant claimed compensation for the loss to his asset register um, of 764 enslaved people, including perhaps uh, Isabella and Susanna Thomas, both of whom were mentioned to him in letters in 1819 when they each gave birth to a daughter. So the family took this money, accumulated on the backs of enslaved African people, and invested it in a local slate quarry, which turned a dispersed cottage industry into a global business. And you can see here um, a really dramatic 1832 painting of the Penryn Slate Quarry, which gives a sense of the scale of the quarry and the vast number of people who worked there in extremely dangerous conditions. So these histories of enslavement and exploitation, of growth and of profit and of consumption, you know, they're universal, but they um, are really concisely expressed in the existence of Penryn Castle. And of course, the legacies of these massive power and wealth inequalities are still with us today. So in our, you know, in our trade networks, in our structurally racist society, in our changing climate. Um, but until recently, there were very few stimuli to trigger visitor engagement with the castle's histories of slavery and exploitation. So until 2020, one of our only collection items um, with an explicit link to Jamaica, which is this sort of highly idealized painting of one of the Pennant's plantations in 1871 um, was displayed in a corridor about as far away from the main visitor entrance as you could get and also behind a lamp. Um, so what we found in during evaluation of the visitor experience in 2019 when the only interpretive method available um, was via conversation with our castle guides, um, what we found was that some visitors were leaving the castle without ever finding out the connections between Penryn and slavery, because with nothing to trigger a conversation between guides and visitors about where the money came from, we were, as an accredited museum, you know, completely failing to convey one of the most significant aspects of Penryn's history to our audiences. And even more alarmingly, um, in 2018, we found that a creative inter intervention um, in the castle by Manon Stefan Ross which touched on the relationship between Penryn and the enslavement of African people was being undermined by some of the volunteer guides when they spoke to visitors before or after the exhibition itself. So some guys were saying things like, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, don't pay attention to that rubbish. I'll tell you what's actually important about Penryn. So, you know, there it seems like they just don't see the value of interpreting Penryn Castle's history holistically, or perhaps that they had objections to talking about histories of slavery full stop. 
And then in other cases, uh, when they said, you know, oh, but you can tell from Lord Penryn's letters that he was always concerned for these people's welfare, you know, it just suggested a basic lack of understanding about chattel slavery. So I, I, when I joined the castle in 2018, I felt that lack of knowledge um, among the castle team, both staff and volunteers, was leading to, you know, a best uh, misinformation and, and at worst kind of a painful and, and, and insulting diminishment of voices which were already on the periphery of our interpretation. So in 2019, we started looking for ways to tackle these hurdles between where we were and where our ambition was for the future, which was to actually share permanent history of slavery and colonialism. The first hurdle, you know, was our existing displays weren't triggering conversations. The second was that not all the people in the castle were behind um, our ambition to do this. And the third, I guess, was just that lack of knowledge was, was, was really undermining our efforts to do it when we could. Um, so to put it another way, you know, we needed to do those three things I mentioned at the beginning, which would trigger the conversations between our team and visitors, skill the team up to support mature and confident engagement with these histories, and um, work to ensure a safe environment in the context of structural racism for the visitors and the team. So we started by putting Perman's history of slavery and colonialism front and centre. Um, building on earlier work with Colonial Countryside, which was an external project led by Corinne Fowler, who's now Professor of Postcolonial Literature at the University of Leicester. We created What a World, which is an exhibition throughout the castle along our standard visitor route. Uh, it's developed in conjunction with 15 local school children, poets, and also some historians. Um, and it casts a sort of a new light on what's significant about our collection. You know, a lot of the objects that we dug out um, were, uh, were otherwise displayed kind of in the corners of dark rooms or um, in the wrong kind of places. They just had always been in the background. Um, and, and, and here's a picture of some of our 10 and 11 year old children in their uniforms um, with a volunteer castle guide in the dining room at Penryn. So we focused on those objects you can, um, which, which sort of drew connections between the Penryn you see today and the histories of slavery and the culture of colonialism. So this is the drawing room, which um, has a teapoy highlighted. That's the, the object on the plinth. Um, it's an amazing transcultural object, which would have been, you know, it would have held Jamaican sugar, Chinese tea. It's made from South American rosewood, and it's got a name taken from both Sanskrit and Persian. And so, so it's a really powerful expression of empire. And it used to be displayed in a bedroom, in a back bedroom somewhere, you know, completely out of context. Um, and then the poetry, um, displayed alongside highlighted objects uh, encouraged visitors or encourages visitors still I suppose to look closely and consider a different way of understanding them so that's an Egyptian statue of Osiris um, about 4,000 years old probably acquired by George Shulter Douglas Pennant during his travels in the Middle East and North Africa in the 19th century and this poem by Fatima he had money and I had history his money bought my history you know, kind of completely nails it for me and I think draws attention to or help help certainly helps me see in a new light um, an item which otherwise kind of just fades into the background of yeah of course there's a bit of you know Egyptian stuff in a stately home like why wouldn't there be and it sort of um, I hope it challenges visitors to question themselves as to why that might be um, so Leon uh, is an 11 year old boy um, who worked with us put it this way drawing a connection between a glass dome of stuffed birds and wider histories of colonialism and slavery. He said, it's important to talk about these objects because some of everyone's history is dark, unpleasant and brutal. Take the bird dome. They have taken something beautiful and treated it as if it was not living, as if it were property. This castle is beautiful. These objects are beautiful, but they come from cruelty. Some of them come from cruelty to enslaved African people. Writing these poems made me reflect and think back on the story of Penryn. I'm not a very emotional person, to tell the truth, but it's important to think about our past and other people's past. Why does this castle exist? We need to look at the beauty of the past, but also recognize our mistakes and build a better future. Why make the same mistakes again? Introducing what a world as an intervention in the castle has made Penryn's history of slavery and colonialism a talking point. You know, one which our team and our visitors both have to work really hard if they want to ignore. And it's also offered us a vehicle to support the team 
um, to develop their knowledge and practice of talking about this history. Um, which leads me on to my next point. One of our particular concerns was how volunteers and staff on the ground would cope with engaging with visitors on the colonial violence of slavery, wealth extraction and consumption, um, and also the continued violence of their legacies. Because, you know, although it's by no means explicit, what a world invites or, you know, depending on your point of view, forces uh, its audience into a position of witnessing race trauma. And this concept of witnessing is something I've taken from the psychotherapist Eugene Ellis's The Race Conversation, an essential guide to creating life-changing dialogue. He writes, the witnesses are in the position of being both spectators to perpetrators indefensible acts and also spectators to the harm they themselves unconsciously or ignorantly inflict. So we were asking volunteers to confront their own reactions to this, but also to engage with both some visitors who might really deeply feel the pain of these histories and their legacies, and then also with other visitors for whom engaging with concepts of colonial violence disrupts you know, cherished public narratives of our nation. And then you add to that the increasingly heated culture war in Britain, where the heritage sector is one of the battlegrounds. Um, and we kind of were in a position where we were, um, we feared sort of the development, I guess, of an entrenched dividing line between a younger, more woke professional staff team and an older, more traditional volunteer body. Um, and as we developed our approach to supporting the team to provide mature interpretation of slavery and colonialism, we, we decided we needed to set out a few guiding principles. Um, the first was the important, importance of evidence and specificity to build a solid foundation on which to begin. The second was the centrality of empathy an emotion to the exhibition and to our engagement with the history. And the third was that we all needed to develop our own individual approach to integrating new knowledge and skills into our ways of engaging with the public. So, so no scripts, no rote learning of information. And, and it was that that was going to enable guides to actively respond to visitors and also to each other in order to address specific issues and questions um, and misunderstandings that non-responsive interpretation can't do. Like that's what's so special about person-led interpretation. So we focused our learning program then on the history of slavery and colonialism as directly related to Penryn and its collections, a contextual exploration of the history and politics of talking about race and colonialism in Britain, and activities designed to tap into our emotional and empathic responses um, to what we were learning. So having seen the value of creative writing workshops with children who created What Are Worlds, um, we commissioned a poet to create two workshops for staff and volunteers. So we wrote over 1500 lines of poetry together, um, some of which we display with one of the objects, um, a documents box that could have held records relating to enslaved people on the Penance Jamaican plantations. Um, Making that poetry writing process clear and getting volunteers involved right at the beginning was a like, real winner for us because it helped the guides to advocate for poetry on display um, and also to feel ownership of the exhibition. And it also gave them an opportunity to talk about their emotional responses to this history and to the challenges of sharing it with visitors. And then at the same time, for those who are more inclined to kind of to value evidence, um, we set up a volunteer research group. Uh, with members kind of tasked to seek out information to fill the gaps of our knowledge in around each focus object and then to share that in digestible form. And I acted as a kind of research supervisor, which was a fantastic way of reiterating the importance of really evaluating and citing your sources and being precise about what information you can share with confidence. And I suppose also gave me a bit of a mechanism to ensure that they were, you know, um, to, to, to kind of to have conversations around language and um, yeah, the, the need for sound and specific evidence but it also gave volunteers the opportunity to take ownership of their own interpretation. And in some cases, it just provided the most amazing detail from the Penryn archives, um, which sort of presented by volunteers helped break down the barrier between the staff sort of conveying information to volunteers and the volunteers themselves. And so the next step, I guess, was then just to place the work we were doing in its historical and cultural context. Um, so we hoped that, um, lectures like Corin Fowler's um, Which Words Do I Use? A Practical History of Language on Race and Empire from 1700 to the Present kind of would de-escalate tensions by helping us all understand why language changes. Um, 
and 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 she also did common objections to talking about empire and heritage settings and how to respond um which sort of provided a similar opportunity to look critically at the competing assumptions at play in these conversations so this learning and engagement program was the largest part of the final key element of preparing to share Penman's histories of slavery and colonialism which was ensuring that you know our interactions didn't endanger other people's well-being um, but it had to sit within a really clear framework of what we expected from staff and volunteers which is quite straightforward with staff because you know we're contractually obliged to adhere to the national trust's values and to deliver the aims and you know you can performance manage people and all these sort of things but there was quite a lot of squeamishness about managing volunteers in a similar frank fashion but without making clear the boundaries of what was acceptable we were i I felt we were treating volunteers disrespectfully. So after the initial tranche of learning, the learning and engagement program, we set out for volunteers, how we expected them to interact with the content of the exhibition and with those who came to visit. And we followed that up with further learning and engagement work to support increased knowledge and confidence. But we're also now empowered to address issues around language, interpretation style and understanding with volunteers. Um, and say, you know, this is the bargain. Are you keeping you know, are we both keeping our sides up so through that process and um, we did have some who have chosen not to volunteer with us as a result um which is a choice that we respect but on the flip side you know another volunteer who was initially unhappy with our plan to focus on Penman's connections to slavery told me that as a result of our work she talked to her daughter about racism and her daughter had recommended that she read why i'm no longer talking to white people about race by rennie edo lodge which this volunteer found really uncomfortable because she recognized herself in Eddie Lodge's descriptions of liberal but still racist white people. And then she read David Olashoga's Black and British and she said, and I'm quoting here, it's really changed my life. So since we've reopened, um, which was in May this year, um, I've been holding reflective sessions with volunteers and staff to understand how exposure to regular conversations about slavery and colonialism is affecting them. And we've all more or less had the same experience, which is that initially we kind of experienced a lot of stress and high emotion, especially when we had challenging conversations. But after a few days of guiding and kind of regular exposure, a bit of time away, some time to kind of go back to the evidence-based info packs or recommended reading to check the information we've been challenged on, um, our confidence levels increased. And I think we've expanded our window of stress tolerance, you know, our ability to manage the discomfort of speaking about slavery and colonialism and also race trauma in a castle which is literally built to divert us from looking too closely or thinking too hard about where that money came from. So despite my fears that guiding what a world would be emotional roller coaster, the kind of biggest surprise has been the extent to which people have just taken it in their stride. Um, but I suppose that also leaves me with kind of my final concern I suppose at the moment or not final concern but you know a, a, a hanging concern for me is that what a world was meant to last a single visitor season in 2020 it didn't so we did all of our training and engagement in 2019-20 with volunteers but it didn't actually open until 2021 and it's now going to run until the end of 2022 so I'm quite concerned that the exhibition and the themes that we're exploring there are kind of becoming a bit work a day for everybody and that maybe the empathy and engagement that we feel with these stories is fading. Um, the exhibition has sort of triggered really profound and quite challenging conversations with new people for us. And I want to make sure that we're responding to those. Um, so this winter, we're going to be spending time kind of reconnecting with our feelings and our curiosity about these histories through a fiction based Brooklyn film club and trips to other places to widen our horizons. Um, and I'm really hoping this will refresh us for 2022 and enable us to have further conversations about how we are all going to progress our understanding and engagement with these histories. And I'll just finish with um, a few more words from a volunteer, Dave, who told me after the most recent reflective session um, that being involved in what a world has immensely broadened my knowledge and understanding of our shared colonial history. I really wanted to express how many doors into fascinating aspects of history, including my personal history, I would not have opened without the, ex the exhibition. Um, so that is a kind of a small win. Yeah, but there is an awful lot more um, for us still to do. And that's me. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Eleanor, for that really interesting um, and detailed presentation on some of the great approaches that you're taking at Penryn Castle. Just a reminder to everyone that we'll have a question and answer session for all of our speakers who are still able to be here at 2.40. So do pop any questions you have for Eleanor or any other of our speakers today in the chat box and Larry will be monitoring that uh, ready for our Q&A, which will be, be after our next speaker, um, who is Neville Stankley, his Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of the Social Enterprise Cultural Syndicates. Hello, He'll be talking um, about a partner project. Hi, Neville. He'll hello. be talking about a partner project delivered with the Museum Development Yorkshire Effective Collections Micro-Internships. Um, so I will hand over to Neville now. And again, yeah, do put any questions as they occur in the chat. Okay, well, let me just get my screen up. Right, can we see that? Yeah, that's great. Thank that's you. That's great. Okay, right. You've already seen. Oh, there we go. There I am. Yes. Um, looking uh, much younger and slightly more hairy in a pre-pandemic photo there. So it's thank you very much for inviting us to um, come and talk um, and the, the actual um, sort of final one before the Q&A. Um, I want to come at this from a slightly different angle, not specifically looking at how to interpret difficult history, but looking at processes by which we can begin to develop a diverse workforce, which creates a sustainable um, uh, way of effectively beginning to think about all the challenges that um, are now before us. And I'm just going to case study this through um, a project we did um, called Effective Collections Micro Internships. Now, I have to apologize um, right at the, the beginning because this was a project run in September 18 through to March 19 and was submitted by two members of staff. I wasn't part of the project um, and they have moved on. So my knowledge of it is, is not in depth, shall we say. So you're going to get an overview for 15 minutes or so. Um, but I'm more than happy to take any questions um, after uh, and answer it as best I can. Okay. So um, why am I coming at it from this perspective? Because again, we're not a museum, we're a social enterprise, uh, cultural syndicates, um, and have been a, a CIC since 2014. Um, when myself coming out of um, higher education um, was seeing the graduates were struggling to get work. So we created this enterprise to try and get um, graduates work uh, in the sector when it was increasingly difficult. Now, our mission obviously moved, has moved beyond that. And we're now drilling down into supporting um, teenagers and um, even younger teenagers now to understand what the culture and heritage sector can offer and how we can support the heritage sector to um, diversify and think about um, recruiting in different ways. Okay, so that's us and that's why um, I'm coming at it from this angle. We work primarily with small and sort of medium sized museums, quite often voluntary run, um, sometimes with you know, maybe one or two members of staff. Um, and I've heard this word come up quite a lot today, um, in fact, in, in the previous presenter, um, the word confidence. Um, it's an interesting um, word that I find an awful lot in terms of by doing, you gain the confidence. So the confidence in recruiting diversely or trying to recruit diversely um, is something I'm very keen to encourage. Um, and also, and again, Words like challenge have come up again in terms of how you create an inclusive workplace if you're beginning to get people in who have very different uh, backgrounds and experiences than my, you, you might have in your current volunteer or um, staffing workforce. And again, part of our work is to help organizations get a greater understanding of the benefits of taking people from a diverse range of backgrounds effectively by encouraging them to take part in projects such as ours. I'd really be interested in how the workforce really does influence interpretation, but that, um, that's not something for today, but it's a really interesting question for us as a sector. Okay, so 
onto the project. Um, we're based in Nottingham, so we're in the East Midlands, and that's our sort of core area. Um, and we've been expanding out of that. And so we've been we worked with Museum Development Yorkshire in this particular project, like I say, um, in the winter of 1819. And I noticed that um, our submission to um, this particular conference said we look forward to the challenges of uh, 2020 and the new decade to come. And my goodness, um, uh, haven't we had some challenges? Um, so this feels really quite quite old and quite almost a stepping point where I've seen you know, lots of people who've taken some of the ideas that we were working on and really running with them. It's really been great to, to hear um, during the course of the uh, conference that I've been able to see. So we collaborated with the Museum uh, Yorkshire to test a variety of internships, to test um, uh, uh, different types of approaches that might be suitable for the organizations based upon um, light touch micro internships, effectively a week's work experience. And that seems to match quite a lot of work experience type of activity that museums get offered. And um, you may have taken some yourself from, from different organizations. I must stress, this is a pilot. We were testing um, and we were testing you know, into 19. We produced an evaluation report and we had all sorts of ideas and plans of moving this forward in 2020 obviously 2020 had other ideas um, with what we should be doing. So we partnered with um, three organizations in, um, in the MDY area. Each side created their own recruitment plans, discrete project plans, uh, their own intern support plans um, with our assistance, but they had free range to try and experiment and do um, things that they felt um, do themselves. The aim is to attract somebody who is new to the sector. You know, there wasn't wasn't any more specific than that, with little, if any, sector experience, um, to give them an idea of the type of work that is available in museums and whether you know they would consider a career, etc. And also from the other perspective is for the organization to begin to understand the challenges and benefits of um, taking this approach to recruiting, in this case, volunteer interns. So we went with um, safe, but you know, collections based, you know, the, you know, the, the cliche of the museum, you look after objects and collections. Um, so just to give a brief overview, um, Museum of uh, North Craven Life, the intern completed a review and uh, modification of movement control documentation um, as part of prep work for move of their objects to a new store. So they set it in place so they got external training to look at best practices. Um, they um, um, went to networking sessions um, and um, engaged with the members of the team allowing them to understand the roles beyond what they were um, being given to, to do and actually begin to develop their own um, networks. And I think this is important in groups such as this that I'm talking to today in terms of finding your own support networks. Again, people trying to get into the sector feel lonely, feel like I say, where is my peer group? How do I get in? So it was really nice that um, we can support them into almost creating a, our own little network, which is what we sort of do at culture syndicates with our heritage assistance, as we call them. Okay, so that was Craven. Uh, Ripon, um, this in turn um, was, had an activity to create a top 50 um, objects from the museum's collection to go on their pilot digital database. Um, completed two thirds of the project um, but still considered a success. So in other words, completion of the project isn't the ultimate aim of this. Um, it's the processes involved in this. So we've got about two thirds of the way through the actual uh, project, um, where they were researching, collecting data, photographing, and getting things ready for the database. Um, and spent, I think, most of that time on that, you know, as compared to the North Craven Life intern. Um, again, engaging with other members of the team, understanding the broader context of the museum. No external training in this um, particular internship. Barnsley, um, th this one was to um, 
organize and relocate uh, the outreach collection of Barnsley Museums. So again, three very different ways of looking at collections and collections management. Um, this time, the intern grouped them into relevant collections, organized them for ease of access for the education team, etc., and did some extensive research on World War I. So again, we're harking back to a time, September 18 to 19, where the World War I activities were still, still going on. And so developed um, some activities around ages and group types for their outreach collection. Again, part of the process was to engage with the staff members, shadow activities, and understand their inner workings and get to know things beyond the project. So again, there is a discrete project, they have ownership, they develop things, but they're getting this wider perspective. So each organization, free range to decide how much time is spent on training, how much time is spent on networking and, and on the project itself. Um, we supported that process and we were always there for any intern who felt they were not getting support or needed help. So we were there as, as the backup support. So um, I want to cover just a couple of things just in terms of recruitment and obviously outcomes. What is the main challenge? And I think the main challenge for us all as ever is time. Um, and the time we spend thinking, reviewing our interview process, our induction process, alternative ways of working and thinking, building that confidence. Um, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. And if you haven't done it before and you're lacking that confidence, it is a slow process. But obviously what we want to do, encourage them is to see the benefits of actually going through this type of exercise so to remove any barriers to anyone coming in it was open to all no previous experience of working in a museum is needed i can imagine people are starting thinking how many applications will we get um but again if we're going to remove barriers that's the sort of commitment um, we give but as a micro intern again it's how can you sustainably manage this sort of process but the, again, the interview processes were different. The induction processes were all different for each organization. But particularly important was measuring, thinking about the interview, the interviewee, sorry, and thinking about how it would affect the interviewee rather than the organization. So in other words, it's almost like an audience-centered design. It's putting that person first, thinking about that person's growth and engagement, and then accommodating yourself around that as best you can. Quite reasonably done in a micro intern, I'd really love to do this over a, a much longer period of time. Um, and the hope that the short sharp experience would have interesting impacts upon the individuals and upon uh, the organizations themselves. Okay. I've just put one quote, so there's lots of outcomes. Um, From an organizational perspective, A, they were able to prove um, that there are benefits, not just of getting work done, but lots of varied benefits. I mean, I picked that quote because that fits really nicely in terms of having a, a diverse workforce creates diverse ideas and perspectives. Um, the, the other volunteers, et cetera, realized that working in these were primarily young people that actually working with young people could be a benefit and not as challenging as um, expected. Um, and I got a lovely quote um, from one of the organizations say, we want to create some high quality opportunities for people who might struggle to get into the museum sector. So in other words, that's the way you're now thinking, which is really great in terms of the impact of this uh, micro internship. But one of the other benefits was sharing. Now, I think in, as a sector, we're very good at sharing, but the organizations who took part in this um, shared the challenges, um, shared the processes and the ideas of, of doing this, even though they came up with very different um, uh, projects and ways of doing it. Um, here's a quote. It just helped to talk things through beforehand with peers. It helped to talk through some of the potential difficulties and benefits and how to frame the application process to attract a more diverse group. Yeah, we, we don't all know the answers, but it does help to share. 
um, all felt it was all very successful. Again, one has gone on to have a, a really strong relationship with the museum, and they're now much more accepting of this idea. Um, and like I say, ultimately benefiting from this professional perspective. From the individual's point of view, um, it hit all the buttons that we were hoping to do in terms of um, they, they had a much greater understanding of what it's like to work in a museum, what the different types of work in a museum could be, um, and all felt that a career, it was actually something they could consider, um, and many continued a relationship with the museum. Specific skills were achieved, you know, some more than others, but specific um, curatorial skills were developed. But again, much more um, um, important for me is things like softer skills, softer attitudes, confidence. That word again, confidence, comes through. Um, and things like communication. And um, as a quiet person, I feel I achieved some confidence in taking charge of a project, giving them the responsibility. Um, and every, everyone said they enjoyed it. Um, you know, they could discuss the variety of roles. They, they felt they had some sort of network and peer group. Um, and like you say, the placements has also emphasized the amount of collaboration which goes on amongst museum. It is good to see how much they support each other. And I think that was a really lovely final message from somebody who doesn't know the sector, who comes in and, and sees how we all work together. So that was a very, very brief canter. Um, so if you're interested in reading the evaluation report on this pilot project, just drop me a, an email. Or if you're interested in any of this sort of work, I'm more than happy to um, um, chat um, with you later, or like I say, just send me an email. Right. Oh, whew. yeah, see, I got through that. I managed to finish a couple of minutes early, so I'm going to stop sharing. That's okay. Thank you, Neville. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Great to hear about some of the approaches there with, with internships and the value to, to both parties. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Larry for the question and answer. Could I ask uh, all of our speakers who are still here, I can see, see a lot of you, if you could turn your cameras back on. So I think we've got uh, Eleanor, Mamadi and Rian, we've got Norma, um, Helen can't, uh, can't be with us. Uh, I think Glyn has had and Andy have had to leave, but if you are still here, do turn your cameras on. Um, and yeah, do put questions in the chat for our speakers. Over to you, Larry. Great, well, I we haven't had any come in yet. If, well, I've got a few written down, but if there's any you think anyone thinks I've missed, please just post them in the chat again. Um, so I'm gonna ask you some that I have so, you know, while we wait for everyone else to kind of have a think through what they want to ask you. Um, Mamadi and Rian, can you maybe tell us a bit about how, I mean, it sounds like a very involved and really sort of, it was really fascinating to hear about your project and that workshop, but about how that came about and particularly how it came about with the link to Bristol Museums. Shall I start, Mama? Um, we had a, some funding for a student um, to, put on an event regarding this collection. And um, he approached Mama D about the food journey um, event. And I'll let Mama D tell you about that. Jason and I, the student, um, we had both, uh, he does foraging and all kinds of other things related to food and, um, was doing a doctorate looking at uh, tonics in in Jamaica so um, we kind of you know had this common interest um, and I was also trying to look at different ways of presenting food stories um, in a way that was more embodied and so um, th yeah that naturally led us to um, looking at the collections that he was looking at in Jamaica um, that of uh, Lindsay, um, otherwise known as the pro-slavery priest, Arthur Broughton, the taxonomist, and um, Robert Long, who happened to be in Jamaica because his brother was um, curating the history at the time. 
and so putting on the food journey was an em, you know was about um trying to embody the kind of different um ways of looking at the history of these collections um and that led to a further engagement in, a, in another conference looking at the the same uh collections through through a video that you can find on youtube with the same title as the one we're using today um legacies of jamaica and um yeah it was just bringing this other kind of format which would deeply engage with people um on other levels levels perhaps which are not so easily evident and apparent as what the eyes can see um, because the food journey itself is a blindfolded experience and it was unfortunate really that <laughs> we were not able to be with you all um you know in, in the flesh because we would have <laughs> encouraged that uh, experience to take place but this was um uh, another way to try to let different voices from the collections um have a say Great, thank you. Um, right, so um, ne uh, Neville, so just to flag up, Neil in the chat has asked if you can have your email. I seem to get in touch, so if you could reply to her, I'll, that would be I'll, great. I'll pop it in the chat. Yep. Um, and a question for Eleanor from uh, Emma Harper. Has the approach you've taken at Penryn been taken on by any other National Trust properties or are there plans to? Well, we were one of 10 properties that did work with Colonial Countryside and Corinne Fowler. So the other nine also um, also had kind of uh, made decisions about what to do with that work. Um, we happened in 2019 to be able to access quite a lot of money, which is uh, for the National Trust is actually quite, un I mean, it's sort of, it is a very rich organisation and it's also quite unusual to be able to spend a lot of that money on interpretation um, somewhat under the radar as we were able to. So I guess, um, and, and of course that's like, it's even less, um, that's, there's even less opportunity to do that at the moment. Um, so I don't know if anybody else will be, in terms of, you know, kind of doing a, um, a big, uh, kind of project like that you know it was quite resource intensive we ended up we worked with the children over a year did sort of 12 workshops of um, half days in school and on property so it's a huge investment to make and I think um, I don't know if we'll see that in the near future but I hope that some of the lessons that come from it will be um, helpful in the future elsewhere and certainly at Pemrin we've learned a lot from it and are going to be approaching our other histories other histories are kind of more of our history especially in relation to our local community and the um the the conflicts between the um quarry workers and the uh lords penryn who lived in the castle and um, we're going to be approaching that in a similar way of kind of just going at it head on which is I think not unusual in other museums but in the National Trust is slightly more bizarre. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a question again for you Eleanor from Lydia Saul saying does Penryn have particular activities planned for Black History Month? We don't and that is a conscious choice which is that Black History Month is about celebrating Black, it's about celebrating Black people's, you know, lives contribute. And we don't know how to do that at the moment at Penryn. We, our, our understanding of the experiences of the people who were enslaved to build that castle, they're just, they're so, it, they're so slim right now. And um, what we don't want to do is uh, kind of be part of that um sort of trend I suppose of, of jumping on the bandwagon of October Black History Month um, and using that as a way to um, I don't know draw attention to what we're doing when we haven't really done the groundwork for that yet so I hope we'll be doing something more about that um, we're sort of starting to plan for that more now for next year. Great um, and we now have a sort of comment slash question from Mama D which I I think we'll turn back on all the speakers initially, perhaps. 
Um, so she says she's interested to hear from curators here how their institutions manage the emotional slash psychosocial implications of their collections. So this might be something that people want to kind of comment in the chat, but can can some of our speakers maybe comment on that? And perhaps also the flip side of that, how you considered that, you know, yourself when you're working on these projects. Norma, you were um, muted. Yeah, to yeah, sure. yeah, yes. I mean, on, on a more, more kind of positive note with that one, um, there's positive and negative uh, comments with that. But um, the positive for me working with um, Black Miners Heritage in that we've been able to um, help open um, kind of forgotten memories in the miners themselves, in the volunteers, because essentially they were volunteers on our project um, and giving them the time to talk about things um, over time has been very therapeutic for them um, and their families, because we've had a lot of um, daughters, sons, um, grandchildren contact our project and say, thank you. I didn't know about my daddy was a miner or my granddaddy was a miner. So we've had those kind of, um uh, comments come back which have been brilliant um and, and really therapeutic um on the on the downside for us has been um yeah just being not downside but you know be, being sensitive and being aware that these histories are still living histories and they are still sensitive and they are still painful to a lot of people and communities such as mining communities all over the country, particularly in Nottinghamshire, particularly in Yorkshire and the North, Durham and Wales and so forth, where poverty and disparity is 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 thrive and you know is is big in the in certain areas of this of the country where mining was. So um, yeah, so it's been it's been a learning curve, I would say, for everybody on board in our project, um, and learning to understand people's. Yeah, people's story, people's stories, people's experience, um, that they are live living story, you know, they are living history um, and important stories. So it's back for us, it's been valuing valuing um those those histories um and being sensitive to mental health um needs, even particularly during the COVID period, we spent months phoning minors, families and minors, just checking, just saying hello, how are you? A lot of the miners didn't have mobile phones, the older miners, they didn't have mobile phones. So we had to ring their landlines, you know, just check, just say hello, you know, during the last, you know, the lockdown periods, um, as they didn't go out at all. So um it's been it's been a tough, tough time, yeah two years but it's been a really really positive and strengthening time um yeah so that's what i need to say on that thank, oh, you. thank you norma uh, does anyone else want to speak to this point i'd be quite interested to just pick up on that because i um in a way Pemrin castle it's kind of like a lightning rod and it represents kind of the it represents all of the 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 power and oppression of the landowners and the quarry, you know, the, the quarry and basically um, uh, how to put this, you know, it, it kind of, yeah, it is, it is the representation of the power and wealth inequality and the way that power and wealth were kind of accumulated amongst the very few at the expense of the very, very many. Um, and, and that's both a, something that's very kind of local to us because we have descendants of people whose uh, ancestors were, were, or family were part of the um, the Great Strike in 1993, which decimated you know local communities. And then we also have this history that's much that, that we're still trying to come to terms with. You know, that's much further away from us in Jamaica, and also in um, uh, you know also in I suppose West Africa as well. Um, and um, so what I'm trying to say here is people often look at Penryn, or they come to Pen, they either come to Penryn or they don't, but they look at Penryn and it's a way, it's a place to hate. It's a place to like, to demonstrate or to, to kind of focus your anger and your emotion and your pain um, because it represents this, um, this inequality. And it's, I, so I would say, 
yeah, we, we there's no that we have no kind of magic way forward with that yet. But it's something that we're really mindful of when we're thinking about how we interpret what kind of what kind of words we use, what kind of facts we use. You know, what kind of facts can you use in the in the light of that? Um, and so many people's different um, so many people's different needs from a place that can represent all the things that kind of still impact their lives today. I, that's a really garbled answer, but I just am kind of st struck by, um, yeah, the challenge that, that perhaps is particularly um, present in Penryn because it, it, it's, it represents such oppression. Uh, thank you. Um, one point that's sort of slightly tangential point that jumped out to me that might be of interest to people is sort of all of you who spoke sound like you know you've been doing amazing work and you're all obviously like really passionate about this. Some people will not be as confident in their organisations or feel that they have you know the you know for whatever reasons for accurately or not the same level of agency to actually make changes even if they really want to which I realise that kind of sounds like an excuse, but hopefully you know what I'm getting at. Is there anything you would say perhaps to those people? Um, obviously, I think us as a group have and lots of other sector groups and, you know, just us having these conversations. It's hopefully encouraging people to look at this, but perhaps anything you could talk about around that? Anyway. I, um, would perhaps like to say something. Um, I feel that earlier on I was talking about trauma and the, the nature of, of its, its stuck nature and its hidden nature, um, despite the fact that it's something that all of us share for one reason or the other, for all the different things that arose yesterday and those things that have arisen today, that there's this continuum of, of trauma that we we go into a stress response so that we do you know fly from it fight it or freeze in in it um, and hence you know what you're saying that this difficulty of then taking um, action so it seems that some work um, or, or any kind of work that can begin to address the um, the reality of that trauma in not only the populations that are affected um, by the collections as it you know how Eleanor is speaking of it but in the staff in encountering these kinds of reactions as well in 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 those of you who are holding these difficult conversations and spaces to actually recognize you in yourself going through that experience yeah and until um, staff and volunteers can really process that themselves they are not in any position to engage with the public on the same issues yeah so it that I mean it, and it's not simple training <laughs> that's going to get through that they're just like a commitment to a long-term process of dealing with this um, this trauma that's held by all bodies um, in, in this empathetic and um, you know, the ways that uh, Norma is talking about, um, you know, showing empathy, um, but on both sides as well, because I'm wondering <laughs> with Norma's conversations with the miners, what's Norma feeling? <laughs> what's Norma going through during the lockdown in these conversations? Mm -hmm. So it's being kind to oneself, mm. yeah, and recognising that actually this is difficult stuff. Mm. This is, all of it is difficult stuff. The, the very I, I mean I, I put on the, the on the during the film there was that picture with the world thinking about <clears throat> the act of collection itself <laughs> is an act of otherizing things people and things yeah so we've got to deal with that mm. which is really difficult <laughs> so, so let's um, first kind of be kind um, to ourselves and understand that we are needing to um, respond more in a human human and humane way <laughs> to how we respond to it before we deal with others yeah can i add to that i totally agree and i would just add that 
I put on my notes I didn't get to say earlier was recognizing the value of diverse heritage. I think, I think, yeah, I totally agree in that until until staff and volunteers and senior management really value diverse stories, diverse history in their museum or collections, it's it's, it's a hard struggle. But I think it's for us as pra practitioners to step up, be brave and tackle it head on because they can't do anything. They can't sack you for it. That you can take them, take them to court. I would anyway, but um, I will challenge it. And that's what I do now. I challenge any museum I go in. I actually have a conversation with staff or volunteers on the spot when I go, physically go into a museum or email them and to say, you know, there's also this perspective. Is that mentioned or would you consider mentioning it? Just kind of do it in a quite subtle way to begin with until the message gets through um and i've also put um yeah reach out to practitioners there are a lot of people in the community now and uh, people who might not necessarily work in the sector but also professionals in the sector pushing for diverse diversity in in the heritage sector so perhaps teaming up with consultants or specialists or just people that you know even in this conference over the two days who are doing you know great work just reach out to them and and touch base and make friends and talk um, and push things forward. Um, and the final thing I put, which I didn't say earlier, was start now. The time is the time for change is now, and the time is right for change. With everything that's gone off in the world over the last couple of years, uh, you know, it's changed everybody's life. Um, but I think it's it's a time of opportunity as well and to make change while all these changes are happening. We might as well change things for the better for everyone. And in that way, the sector moves forward. People don't leave the sector. There's been thousands of redundancies and job losses in the heritage sector. Why? They shouldn't be. We should fight for our sector and we should fight for inclusion. We should fight for new audiences, new, new interpretations because without people coming to our museums, visiting our websites, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> so we've got to engage and we've got to embrace um, as many people to look at what we're talking about. And those people from all different cultures and all different heritages and you know what I mean? It's, it's a global thing and it's not just UK wide, it's global now. It has been global for a while, but I think people have woken up to the global nature of, of the world right now. So um, I think it's a time of opportunity and it's a, a absolutely exciting time for me um, pushing forward the diversity uh, agenda, which should have been in place years ago. It's late, but now, okay, it's here, it's now. And that's why I'm kind of pushing forward with this. So that's it. Okay, thank you both of you. That was um, I think really helpful, hopefully for everyone. Um, we, have we, had any more? we haven't had any more questions come in and chat. Everyone's being very, very strong this afternoon. Um, is Glyn still here? I think unfortunately he had to go uh, off to a meeting. I had a practical no, question. I am still oh, here. Yeah, you've oh, come you're back. still here. Lovely. <laughs> Sorry, I had a stores meeting. I'd have rather been here, trust me. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I was just going to turn it a little bit more on the casual side and I, I had a practical question I was just personally really wondering about with that virtual tour. Did you just film it on your mobile? How did you do it? Um, yeah, it was just on my mobile. I'm sorry about the um, sound quality and the um, uh, the light as well. Really, it was um, it was a case of of going round um, filming it, and I had lots of um, help from the learning and participation team as well. Um, and then they spliced it and, and stitched it together. Apparently, I'm using that word like I know what it means, but you know, um, I'm saying it confidently. Yeah. Oh, thanks. No, I was just wondering because I thought it looked really good considering it did just look like it was on a mobile. I was like, I can never keep my hand that steady. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, we haven't had anything else come in. What, should we finish a little early, Emma? What do you yeah, think? I'm, I'm sure everyone has other things that they can be getting on with. If you do think of any questions, afterwards and you don't you haven't got the right contact for a speaker do just uh, contact us on the conference shcg uh, gmail or, or on twitter or anything like that and i'm sure we'll be able to get your your questions through to the relevant speakers 
Um, but I'll, I'll wrap up now for um, the 2021 conference. So thank you to all of our speakers across the two days. I'm sure you'll agree we've had lots of interesting papers with lots to think and reflect on. I'm just going to go back to um, two themes that I think have come out throughout the conference um, that Sarah summed up in her top tips yesterday, which was find your allies. Uh, and then you're not the only voice advocating. So we've seen a lot of that today in terms of um, Glyn and, and Andrew Hopper's uh, partnership to start off with, and then the work that uh, Norma's been doing, and Mamadi and Rian, I think all embodies that, um, that find your allies kind of motto and uh, approach. And then finally, every little helps. Um, with, as Larry mentioned, some of us might not yet feel quite as confident in speaking and, and making changes in our organisation. So I think it's about remembering to do the little things and to start somewhere, but to do something. So I'll just end on those notes. I'd like to extend my thanks to Lauren Ryle Stockton and Alison Grange, who originally um, put this programme together for the uh, 2020 conference, and then myself and Victoria have taken it on to, to get it to you in this new world uh, online. Um, and thanks to everyone uh, on committee who's supported us in doing that. If anyone's been inspired by what they've heard over the two days and would like to write for our journal um, the deadline for the abstracts for the next issue is October the 10th and the theme is linked to this conference so all about challenging histories so do get in contact with our journal editor Kirsty at journal shcg at gmail.com for anyone who isn't a member of SHCG and would like to know more about the benefits of membership and what it entails, Larry went over this a little bit this morning, um, but you can find out more on our website here. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to widen conference to beyond our membership. So we'd really like to see some of you who aren't members um, to come and, and join us and, uh, and build a wider network. Um, we will be sending out a feedback survey after conference. Um, if you do have the time, we'd really appreciate you filling that in for us, and that will help inform our future events. On which note, I am now going to announce the theme for our 2022 conference, um, which is going to be on the theme of how museums and cultural venues are creating innovative ways to regenerate local areas and communities. So we'll be sending a call out for papers towards the end of the year. If you'd be interested in contributing, uh, look out for that or get in touch with us directly at conferencesatecg at gmail.com. Uh, there'll be a couple of other events before next conference, um, the decolonisation sort of support network chats uh, via Zoom that Larry mentioned yesterday, uh, and a seminar on the wonders of first face, a fantastic SHCG resource. So do look out for that. Uh, I think that's all of the plugs for now. So just thank you once again for attending and we do hope that you've enjoyed the conference. Thank you.